I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television. Coming to you from London, but dealing with an issue that in one way or another affects the whole world. Two of my good friends are now behind bars. It's not often that someone like me can say that, especially when those good friends have committed no crime that any reasonable person would describe as a crime. Essentially, they are whistleblowers, journalists, publishers, a refer, of course, to the most famous political prisoner in the world, Julian Assange, whose long calvary at the hands of the American and British state. Julian Assange is one of the men that I admire most in the whole world. He's a world historic figure who will be remembered long after the people who have placed him in the maximum security jail in Belmarsh in London. A jail so horrendous that they put mass killers there, child murderers, terrorists are incarcerated there, and this gentle, mild-mannered man, a geek, you might say, who spends, or did, a lot of his life behind a computer finding out things that the rich and powerful in the world would rather that we did not know. He took the view, as do most sensible people, that we have a right to know what our government is doing in our name, on our dollar, and using the state that they govern for, apparently or purportedly, our benefit. Julian Assange's case is well known. Less well known is Craig Murray. The Honourable Craig Murray was the British ambassador in Uzbekistan, sacked by the Tony Blair government, and I quote directly from the document sacking him, as an ambassador, he had over-focused on human rights, unquote. Just get your head round that when you hear British politicians perambulating the world, talking about human rights in selected countries, carefully selected countries, and utilised, deployed, militarised, instrumentalised for very specific political purposes. They didn't want Craig Murray over-focusing on human rights in Uzbekistan because they were interested in Uzbekistan for the Benjamins. The reality is, though, that Craig Murray is behind bars not just for reporting on a trial that uh, captivated at least a part of the country, all of the country I come from, Scotland, the trial of a former leader of the Nationalist Party, political opponent of mine, but a man who was clearly set up for the fall by his former comrades. Craig Murray sat in the eaves of the courtroom and honestly reported, with no ulterior motive, what was actually going on there. That was his problem, because the court and the state did not want people to know what was really at stake in that trial. But actually, his main offence was to have done exactly the same thing across the whole of a decade in support of Julian Assange. And there are others. Edward Snowden told us things we had every right to know about crimes being committed by the government of the United States and the government of the United Kingdom and other governments and has now had to flee and live a presumably cold exile at this time of the year in Russia, far from his home, his family, his loved ones. So what's it all about? Why are people in 2021 now regularly being criminalized 
put behind bars, threatened with extradition to a supermax internal Guantanamo in the United States in Julian Assange's case for a total of 150 years, two entire lifetimes of a human being. Is it a sign of strength on the part of the empire or is it a sign of weakness? As always, I'm just the enthusiastic amateur here. I'm joined by a panel of distinguished experts. Let's begin to meet them now. Simon Hill is the campaigns manager at the Peace Pledge Union, is a writer and an author. The Peace Pledge Union, by the way, is a pacifist campaigning organization working on peace building and nonviolence. Simon believes in the legitimacy of activism and campaigns for re revealing the truth. Simon, welcome uh, to the show. Uh, let's start with the question I posed at the end. Is this kind of thing happening because the empire is strong or because the empire is growing weaker? Well, I think it's a sign that the empire is growing weaker. Strength comes a strong person, a strong institution is able to deal with criticism, is able to deal with open discussion. There is no strength that the person who cannot cope with somebody who disagrees with them in everyday life and an institution that cannot cope with being criticised, that's not a, a sign of strength, that's a, a sign of weakness. And yet, Simon, they have managed to mm. corral uh, the support of what is supposed to be the fourth estate, the mass media, which has never been more huge in our lifetime, never been more high-powered, and yet is virtually entirely silent on these three individuals, except where they're joining in the persecution of the whistleblowers. Well, I think it's worth noting that, um, as, as I know you know very well, George, the many of the newspapers in Britain are owned by a small clique of, of billionaires. Um, we have a, a degree of free speech in Britain because our ancestors campaigned for it, not because the rich and powerful graciously gave it to us, but because our ancestors campaigned for that. But that is abused when you have a system in which a small number of billionaires own most of the, uh, own most of the newspapers. And so we see, for example, um, you know, when it comes to some of these individuals we're talking about, including many who are not in Britain, such as, as you say, Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning and, and so on, that, um, for example, with Craig Murray, when I first heard about it, I, you know, I glanced at the headlines and it, was said, it had said that he had revealed the identities of witnesses in the Alex Salmond case. And I thought, well, much as I admire Craig Murray in other areas, I, I don't agree with revealing the identities of, uh, of potentially vulnerable individuals. But then, of course, it turns out that it, it's not as if he'd published their names. He's published details which it said, if you link up lots of bits of information, then you might you know, you might be able to identify him, identify them. Whereas, um, you know, which seems extremely excessive to then go to the point of putting him in prison. He's the only yeah. journalist that's been sent to prison for that Indeed. supposed offence mm. ever in Britain. It's an so extraordinary thing. It's, it, it's extraordinary when these individuals are picked out. But I would also like to say that, um, although it's important we consider these relatively prominent individuals such as Julian Assange and, and Craig Murray, we need to remember that on a less, even less noticed level, there are activists getting arrested all the time on, on quite peaceful protests. And now the British government is proposing a new police bill which will massively restrict uh, the rights of you and me and everyone else in the UK to protest peacefully with really vague wording about the police being able to stop a stop a demonstration because it causes inconvenience. Which means if I'm demonstrating against an arms company, the police can say you're inconveniencing the, 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 the bosses of this arms company. Clause 56 of the new police bill, if it, if it goes ahead. And you're not allowed to take their picture either. Dr. Deepa Govindarajan, you are an academic trade unionist, a lecturer in governance, programme program director, uh, but you've also been extremely active in the Julian Assange case. 
Speak to that case in particular, if you would, first. What is it about Julian Assange that has caused Britain and America to move mountains, shred their uh, already tattered reputations in the persecution of this man? As Simon said earlier, WikiLeaks was unique and different. And the reason WikiLeaks was unique and different was because, firstly, it broke through the establishment consensus where you had a small number of oligopolists determining what was discussed in the media. The second thing WikiLeaks did was to allow us as ordinary people to surveil the state. We had had decades of the state surveilling us. But here was an organization allowing us to surveil the state Very good using point. a huge amount of information, which was, you know, we had information which was present. Pre if you look at um, Daniel Ellsberg with the Pentagon Papers leaks, he had to photocopy the leaks overnight in order to provide them to the New York Times. But as we get through the stage where Chelsea Manning came out as a whistleblower, vast amounts of information are stored about us, about um, various forms of military intervention on systems where whistleblowers cannot easily communicate to journalists. And WikiLeaks was the first organization to provide a secure Dropbox. Because of the quality of expertise that WikiLeaks surrounded itself with, to make sure that the documentation was accurate. So accurate that to this day, WikiLeaks has a 100% accuracy record. And then there were other things that WikiLeaks did, which is to allow for archival, which means that you can compare what comes out of the leaks with declassified documentation today, and allows you to, that allows you to put into perspective things like, for example, the Queen has intervened in Scottish, uh, in, in Australian politics, in, Scottish um, decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So all these kinds of things are only available through WikiLeaks. The other brilliant thing that WikiLeaks did was to allow our whistleblowers to contact not just the New York Times or the Guardian or the Washington Post of this world, who would you know, devote a few column inches to something that might have local relevance in, say, Tunisia or Lebanon or Kenya. In, instead, what it did was create two tiers, one where You'd have these international articles that you could communicate via The Guardian or The Washington Post, but also local articles which were re responsible, for example, in Tunisia for the Arab Spring. It was responsible for uncovering corruption in Kenya with Daniel Arab Moy's government. It was in involved in a range of things, including trafficurous toxic waste dumping off the Ivory Coast. And those of you who, those of your viewers who are interested in COP26, will want to look at the scale of the environmental leaks or the trans-Atlantic um, uh, kind of trade and investment partnerships that were being built and whose details you could soon find out through the WikiLeaks releases and really understand the scale of corruption, the scale they of... They blew the lid off so many things. Indeed. Nothing more than uh, the war logs, which revealed horrific war crimes. Indeed. In, uh, in video. You, you didn't have to believe anyone's words. You could watch those war crimes uh, being committed. We'll come back to that. Rod Driver, you're uh, an academic, a commentator, a, a television man, uh, a bit like myself these days. Uh, answer my earlier question, if you would. Is this all a sign of the strength and ebullience and determination of the empire, or does it show that the Tiger's teeth are beginning to fall out and it's getting nervous. Well, I think that's a really good question. I think the answer is sort of quite complex in that uh, if you uh, go back to what Julian Assange once said in an interview, he was talking about what he hoped would happen when WikiLeaks was up and running and all of this information started to become public. He had hoped that members of the public would act upon all this information and that would bring about change. But in fact, that has not happened. And he realized that there's a sort of dimension missing, which is power. And that we've uh, noticed over the years, let's say if you go back to the 2003 Iraq war protests, there were millions of people in Britain, millions of people in America, millions of people all over the world marching against the Iraq war. And yet the politicians were able to just ignore those people and go ahead and commit their war crimes. 
At the same time, I think there's something much more complex happening at an international level where America is the dominant empire or has been for many years, but it's starting to realize that actually China and Russia are a potential check on its unlimited power. And so in that sense, they're feeling that they have less power. So one of the things that I was very interested in was um, if you look at when uh, Donald Trump was the president and if you look at his senior people, so one or two people might have heard names like John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, so his very senior staff, they were saying quite openly, let's go and overthrow the government of Venezuela because we want to control their oil resources. 30 or 40 years ago, the CIA would have had to do that type of thing in secret, right? Now it's just brazen, it's just out there in the open and they feel they don't have to hide it in the same way. So I think there are some people within the administration in say America or in Britain thinking that they have almost unlimited power relative to their own populations, that uh, they can do whatever they want to do and there's no way to hold them to account. But there's a, a sort of recognition of a check at an international level. And this is also connected, I think, with developments in Britain, say within the Labour Party, where basically Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, is essentially an establishment stooge. And his role is to make sure that the Labour Party offers no serious opposition whatsoever, and the, the Conservative Party and the government can do whatever they want they want to do. And so again, in that sense, ordinary people have no channel to oppose no, government policies. We know more, but can influence less, yeah. is really what you're saying. Let's get an American perspective. Kevin uh, Gostola is in Chicago. He's the managing editor of shadowproof.com, a reader-supported journalism dedicated to exposing abuses of power in business and in government. He produces and co-hosts a weekly podcast, Unauthorized Disclosure, which is, in a way, what this is all about. Let's hear from Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Kevin, Julian Assange, uh, the uh, whole raft of people now being prosecuted, persecuted, sent to prison, uh, uh, Edward Snowden, uh, Craig Murray, Daniel Hill. The list is becoming so long I can't actually adumbrate it properly. What's going on? Why are they doing this? Yes, what we see from Western security agencies is this targeting of people who dare to expose their criminality, to challenge their conduct. We see that not only are whistleblowers being targeted by the security apparatus of, of these various Western countries, but that also journalists are being targeted as well. Uh, some cases, they're collateral damage. But in the case of Julian Assange, it's quite deliberate that they are targeting a publisher. They are going after him. It's now pretty much accepted in the establishment press, thanks to a Yahoo News report, that the genesis of this prosecution against Julian Assange is entirely political and a product of the CIA's desire to seek revenge against Julian Assange for his journalism, for the work that WikiLeaks was doing on materials from the CIA. The opposing view is that revealing these kind of things causes diplomatic rifts, could even put people's lives at risk. Is that a legitimate argument? Well, in the case of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, uh, you can look at the record for the extradition hearing that took place in September 2020, and numerous journalists came forward to describe the care that was taken with documents to ensure that people were protected, including, let's say, activists who were working with the U.S. State Department informants that were working with the US military, uh, people who had risks if their identities were exposed, that was taken into consideration. Uh, these weren't document dumps. WikiLeaks didn't plan to spill out hundreds of thousands of documents without taking care of the people in them, at least in terms of the, the documents that we're talking about that are at issue in the extradition case. 
So how can we solve this conundrum? Whistleblowing of this kind is illegal so far as the state is concerned, but the public's right to know uh, most people would regard as sacrosanct. How do we square this circle? What should be done is there should be more declassification of information. Uh, that's the first and foremost priority that journalists should advocate as well as citizens of these countries should advocate. These security institutions are keeping too much information secret from the public. And for the most part, I'd, say, I'd suggest that 70 to 80% of it is information that has nothing to do with sensitive information on the ground. So to speak, like we're not talking about troops that are going to be put in danger of a terrorist attack if they are revealed to be in certain locations. We're not talking about the disclosure of that location. We don't want people to see the blueprints for how nuclear facilities are operating so those would be compromised. We're talking about information that suggests how the national security agencies feel they can conduct new forms of warfare, hybrid warfare, the way they can use cyber attacks, the way that they can conduct drone attacks, that kind of thing, what they can do to engage in surveillance against people and jeopardize their privacy and, and violate their privacy, which is the focus of Edward Snowden's whistleblowing. And, and so those are the materials that we need to force out. And if you force out those materials, then it means that we'll be at will be in need of less whistleblowing. There will be less need for those people in these institutions to take risks and become sacrificial lambs and give up their careers. But at the moment, that's the only option that we have as far as a public to know what these institutions are doing. Are you satisfied at the level of support that people like Julian Assange are receiving from the public? Well, we need to break it down. When you look throughout the United States, you see civil society organizations that care about press freedom and human rights that have, for the most part, spoken up and said they're opposed to the US Justice Department pursuing the extradition of Julian Assange. You see uh, editors and chiefs of these newspapers, major newspapers, some of the news networks that have said this is wrong, what is being done but they still see Julian Assange as somebody who's different than them. And they use words in a way that enable the CIA to continue to push this prosecution through the Justice Department. And in doing so, that means that Julian Assange still remains in this very awful situation. So um, I think the answer to this question is that there's a lot more we need to hear from the media in the way of solidarity, but I'm skeptical that they will give it. Much more of this after the break. Stay tuned. You're watching Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, talking about whistleblowers. And the whistles that they've blown were, of course, of importance all over the world, not least in the Middle East and throughout the Muslim world. There's an old saw in Britain, thank God you cannot bribe or twist the average British journalist. But when you see what unbribed he'll do, you realize there's no reason to. The truth is that journalists like Craig Murray and Julian Assange are very rare jewels indeed. Rod, uh, the uh, contribution from the astoundingly young and brilliant young American, what did you make of it? Uh, well, I thought he made some excellent points, actually. Um, in that one of the things that I try to uh, uh, teach people when I'm explaining about uh, how, what's wrong with the way the world works is about what's wrong with democracy. And one of the key things is that in countries like Britain and America, you have far, far too much secrecy. And this is one of the points that Kevin picked up on when he was saying that a huge amount of uh, information that is classified. Well, 
the various historians have gone through all sorts of historical documents that in the past were classified and are now declassified or unclassified and so they're available to the public. And you can look at them and they write books about them. And what they've realized is that the vast majority of documents that are classified are not really related to official secrets or national security in any meaningful sense. It's actually about covering up the crimes of powerful people. And I think this is a debate that you never see in the mainstream, that they just buy into concepts like official secrets and national security as if it must be kind of meaningful and we just have to accept what the government tells us about it. Well, I've actually lived so long that I'm now seeing declassified documents uh, about events in which I was quite heavily involved at the time. It's quite chilling. But the point that you make is uh, absolutely correct. For the most part, they were classified to cover up illegal activity uh, by the British uh, government. Speaking of which, Dr. Deepa, uh, as uh, our American guest uh, said, thanks to Yahoo News, not exactly a revolutionary uh, newspaper, uh, we now know the Americans were making plans even to assassinate Julian Assange on the streets of London and actually, perhaps even more seriously, to have a shootout with Russian diplomats if the Russians sought to give diplomatic protection to Assange. It's amazing, really. It is indeed. And for those of... Uh, I'd like to take a step back and talk about what they did with Guantanamo, which is the Americans said, anyone who's held at Guantanamo or any of the black sites, all these, you know, the 780 odd Muslim men who were held at Guantanamo for years without charge, without due process, were all illegal enemy combatants. And because they were illegal enemy combatants and they were on this site, which was outside of America, normal American legal processes did not apply. They could continue to torture them horrendously and ill-treat them horrendously, and there would be no comeback. And they tried to do the same with WikiLeaks, and that's what the Yahoo News investigation established, which is Pompeo had classified WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence agency. This meant that the intelligence organizations could go after WikiLeaks journalists in a way that was outside of congressional oversight. And part of making those plans to try and kill him in the embassy, to think about having a shootout on Knightsbridge Street with the collusion of the British intelligence, were all part of this same attempt to make what they were doing, which was completely illegal, within the law because now the law didn't apply. So you have that in Julian's case, but you have two other things. They used an Icelandic supposed hacker who's not actually a hacker, and they got him to testify that Julian had hacked into third country systems. And actually this man is a convicted fraudster and pedophile. And the F he is the FBI. He's actually in prison now, he is in indeed. Iceland. He is indeed. And the FBI, use him as their main witness in the case, and he is referenced in the judgment that Vanessa Brezza gave criminalizing journalism. The third thing that they did... Well, before was, you leave that, sure. he uh, has now recanted he has the indeed. evidence that he gave against Julian Assange. So the mightiest country in the world is moving all these mountains to get the extradition of someone based on the evidence now recanted of a convicted pedophile, a convicted fraudster, and a convicted thief who's now recanted his evidence anyway. It, it, is, it is unbelievable. And then you have the story of Julian being surveilled in the embassy, and anybody can look this up on YouTube. You have day after day of video where the US have used a third country, a Spanish security company, to surveil not just Julian and his guests, but also privileged legal conversations mm. and medical conversations, which mean that Julian cannot get a free trial, either in Britain or in America. Quite so. In fact, they even surveyed me in the lavatory <laughs> of the Ecuador embassy whilst visiting him. Uh, and Pamela Anderson, too. Uh, it is... Uh, 
something that would kill any legal case in any jurisdiction. Indeed. That the people doing the prosecuting already know all the legal discussions of the person they're seeking to extradite. Simon, the, uh, the uh, Ellsberg was referred earlier, re referenced earlier, and the Pentagon Papers, which were photocopied and then published in the New York Times. It was precisely the wish not to make such a prosecution that stopped the Obama administration mm -hmm from seeking the extradition of Julian Assange. They did not feel confident that they would be able to persuade an American jury that what the New York Times in, uh, did in the Ellsberg case would somehow be uh, illegal uh, in the publishing by the New York Times and many others of Julian Assange's uh, stories. Uh, it all changed when Pompeo was the head of the CIA and Donald Trump was the president. Why do you think Trump went for broke in this case? Well, when it comes to Trump, we can always ask, why did he do what he did? Why did he do always, anything? Why did he do yeah. anything? Um, you know, Perhaps he doesn't know himself. I certainly wouldn't hold up Obama as any sort of hero of, uh, of peace and democracy of either. I mean, I think, and this goes back to what you were saying about, you know, an unfair trial, being spied on in the toilet, etc. I, I think this goes beyond Julian Assange as an individual. This isn't about, um, you know, whether you or I like him, what, you know, what he is as an individual. It's about the basic right to a fair trial and the attempts to suppress information. So, you know, there were allegations that Julian Assange had uh, committed rape in Sweden and whatever the rights or wrongs of that, I, I wouldn't want to... Well, they were um, dropped. Well, they were dropped. Because yes. they were fake. Well, they, they, they may have been, but I... I I'm not saying that I, I, I don't want to be dismissive of those, of any sort of allegation like well, that. If well, let, let me be dismissive. They were dropped they because were dropped. they were fake. Well, they were dropped. I, I, I'm not in a position to know whether they were fake, but whether... Well, if they weren't fake, they wouldn't have been dropped. But we won't go into that. What The point I'm trying to make is that whatever, um, whatever the truth in that case, that is completely different to Julian Assange being imprisoned in Belmarsh, locked up for 23 hours a day in a cell, being surveyed in the, in the embassy, being attempts to extradite him to the US on a political charge to suppress what he's doing. And that is a complete violation of his um, right to a fair trial. And once any, somebody's rights are threatened, you know, all our rights are threatened. All our rights, yes. And just going back to the issue of the, the US troops um, or the US, you know, threatening to have some shootout on the streets of London. I think we're in a position where the US authorities have just got used to the idea that the UK government will let them do anything because... They're probably right. Because, well, <laughs> they, you know, when do they... And, and this goes back to declassified documents. I mean, in, in 1983, documents declassified in 2016 showed that in 1983, the British government, the Ministry of Defence, had been worried that US troops at British bases might fire on unarmed peace protesters outside the base. And so they deliberately tried to arrange the structures at the bases so that if anybody fired on peace protesters, it would be British troops rather than US troops because they knew that if a US soldier killed an unarmed British civilian, support for having US troops in Britain would, would plummet. Well, one um, hopes. And that, we didn't, we, that wasn't revealed till 30 years afterwards. One hopes. Let's go back to America. Uh, Professor David Schultz, from St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, is the author of Combating Corruption, the Development of Whistleblowing Laws in the United States. He's a professor of political science in Hamline University and a professor of law in the University of Minnesota. Professor, most welcome. Thank you very much for having me today. Professor, you've described whistleblowing as truth combating corruption. Can you elaborate on that? Well, in general, what we ought to think about here is one of the things that we want to be able to do in a democracy is to expose government corruption. And there's a variety of ways of doing it. And one of them is through what whistleblowing and sort of the classic way of doing whistleblowing is, is some employee, somebody works for a government agency, finds that what an official is doing something wrong. You know, let's say lying, stealing, cheating, whatever it may be. 
And, and what we do is to encourage that person to come forward to expose the, um, the underlying um, either illegal behavior, or I'm just going to say bad behavior also. And generally, I think we want to cut a little bit more slack and give a little bit more leeway to whistleblowers in government. And the reason why we say that is that if we think of, at least in a free society and for a democratic society, part of what we want to do is to hold government officials accountable. They have an incredible amount of information. Uh, they do a lot of things that the average person does not know. And unless somebody like a whistleblower comes forward and says, look, the government's doing something wrong, it's, it's spying on its citizens, or it's perhaps, let us say, funneling illegal money somewhere else, we're never going to know about that. So whistleblowing, I would argue, becomes one of the most important tools, of not only of free expression, of, of, of like freedom of information, but a way of just holding the government accountable and making sure that it doesn't act impermissibly. What do you say to the opposing view that releasing such sensitive information could even put people's lives at risk? In some cases, it may be true, but we have to start to weigh competing goals and objectives here. Is that, is that there may be some situations there where uh, the information is embarrassing, uh, but just because something is embarrassing doesn't necessarily mean it shouldn't come out. Um, that, that if government officials are doing things um, that, that they cannot tell their citizens about because they're embarrassed, uh, that, that's one issue. But if it does pose, let's say, a real national security risk, we have to do weighing of competing objectives. One is to say, okay, at what point is the risk so great that disclosure shouldn't come out versus on the other side that, again, the public is entitled to know um, what, what that information is. The other thing that I'm worried about, when government officials make the claim of national security, they get to make the claim themselves. Um, they get to say, this information violates national security, it can't be released, and it becomes almost a, a shield, a, a tool that they can use. And the example that I use and it's an old one, but it's a good one still, is what? The release of the Pentagon Papers in the United States back in the 1970s, that the Nixon administration um, was afraid that the release of these, what's called the Pentagon Papers, and the papers were what? Classified documents on how the U.S. got involved in Vietnam. The, the Nixon administration was claiming that to release this would be dangerous, and it tried to and it hurt national security. It would it was trying to prevent the New York Times, the Washington Post from, from releasing it. Eventually they lost those cases. The Pentagon Papers came out and it's hard to say that national security of the United States was compromised as a result of the release of that information. There's my classic example of, of where the government was using the, let's say the false claim of security as a way of hiding accountability, of shielding embarrassing information. So I think we have to read any national security claims very, very narrowly. And again, do that trade-off and ask at what point um, should the public still have a right to know? At what point um, do we is releasing this information critical nonetheless in terms of, let us say, holding government officials accountable? Professor, here's the big question. Whose decision is it to make? What information should be revealed to the public? That, that is a tough question here. And, and generally, I think the presumption ought to be that what all information is public, uh, especially if we're talking about, let us say, um, uh, not just domestic affairs, but international affairs. There's a principle of international law that, for example, all treaties are supposed to be public, and that in many ways we could argue that that almost all diplomatic um, um, issues should eventually be made public, with again the presumption being that that the public has a right to know this information. If push comes to shove, if there's a challenge in terms of, uh, of whether this stuff can or should be released, oftentimes perhaps the only way to do it 
is it has to be fought out in the courts um, at that point that ultimately um, a judge should decide if that information should be released. Professor Julian Assange is in prison. He might be forever in prison. Edward Snowden is in exile. He might be forever in exile. Uh, there are many, many others that are now being prosecuted. Is this the future, do you think? Uh, is the security state closing in on whistleblowing? It appears to be. And what's interesting here and sad is that I picked the Pentagon Papers as my point because there seemed to have been a high point in the 1970s uh, maybe early 80s, where the emphasis upon disclosure, upon the protection of whistleblowers seemed to be growing. And what we're seeing in the West right now is even democratic societies becoming less supportive of, of the basic principles of open government and transparency, and are more and more so invoking the fear of national security. Fear that if, for example, we were to disclose something, um, it might um, it might what encourage terrorists, or it might put us at a greater terrorist risk. In some ways, the attacks of 9/11 in the United States, the attacks that were in the UK, Spain, and around the world, I think scared a lot of democracies into retreating back from these basic principles of 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 disclosure and of now targeting targeting the whistleblowers and shifting the dialogue away from what the government was doing to now saying, look at what this whistleblower did, threatened national security. In fact, I would argue that some of the information coming out from Assange, from Snowden and so forth, were pointing to what? That perhaps government actions themselves were threatening, let us say, the democratic structure or the, the, uh, the national security of the country from the fact that these were countries and actions that were what? Violating democratic principles. Rod, isn't the uh, key point, uh, the one that Dr. Deepa made earlier, that WikiLeaks and anything that came after it, uh, nothing yet, but there will be, uh, democratized this whole process. Now you didn't have to persuade the New York Times to publish something. You didn't even have to persuade a judge to let them do so you effectively made your editorial judgments and, as you said, peerlessly perfect, 100% accuracy in the case of WikiLeaks and absolutely no case being made, even by the US government, that anybody's life was lost as a result of these disclosures. It was the fact that you could now go around the craven media that I've spoken about earlier around parliaments and politicians and go straight to the people with all this information. That was the big innovation of WikiLeaks, wasn't it? I think that's true. I think this was something that was uh, highlighted at the time when all of the Iraq and the Afghan war logs came out, hundreds of thousands of documents showing in immense detail the war crimes by the American government day after day after day in countries where they were occupying. And as Julian Assange himself said, this is a sort of detailed catalog of war, the likes of which the world had never seen before. And here it was available to the general public and we could all see in complete detail exactly what was really going on. And in fact, um, I've come across a number of writers who've said, actually what he was doing was making everything so transparent that he became a threat to war itself. And this is why the American government have pursued him so aggressively that they, they absolutely want to set an example to say to every other journalist in the world, we want the right to carry on with our war crimes Absolutely. without scrutiny, without oversight, without anybody having the ability to stop us. And Julian was showing that actually you might be able to do that. You might be able to stop the Americans and the British committing war crimes by making this information public. And if he was allowed to get away with it, lots and lots of other journalists and whistleblowers would follow suit and say they have stamped down on him as hard as they can. And so they have uh, prosecuted him. I, I'll change the word there. They have persecuted him for over 11 years now. And there's no sign that that is going to end 
in the future. Although the paradox is we already knew all these things that Julian uh, released, but it didn't stop the war in Libya, it didn't stop the war in Syria, the war against Yemen, uh, and so on. So the criminals are carrying on with their crimes whilst making it a crime to tell people about. Dr. Deepa, are they going to get Julian Assange? Well, the lower court judgment, surprisingly, was in Julian's favor. Although it criminalized journalism, pretty much by accepting every single proposition that the US made, the judge ruled that because of the oppressive prison conditions, and I, for those who don't know, that Julian will be placed in an eight by 12 concrete cell. He will be alone 23 hours a day, fed through a hatch. He will be allowed to speak to his family for 15 minutes once a month. And he, will, he may not even be allowed to speak to his lawyers without the FBI surveilling him. So what he faces in the United States with 175 years in a supermax is absolutely horrendous, even at the lowest end of the security classification that they might put him under. So there's that and there's the the severe mental and physical distress that he's, he's encountered within, both within the embassy and at Belmarsh prison, where he's now in a situation where, you know, he's got serious osteoporosis, he's got a chronic lung condition since 2012, he's had a broken tooth, and anybody who's had a toothache will know how hard it is, where, you know, he, ha he had to have a root canal, but the, the British wouldn't allow him out of the embassy. So they are trying their best, but I'm, I'm, despite all of this, on the first day of the trial, I thought, oh, well, maybe the judges have their mind made up. But as we heard the evidence on the second day of the US appeal, it felt to me like the balance had changed. And the balance has changed even politically with more, I know the journal, mainstream media aren't doing as much as they should do, but the mainstream media are talking about the Assange case. They're not necessarily acknowledging the leaks the WikiLeaks made. The, all the major human rights organizations, the part of the controlled opposition. Finally, yes. Yes. So Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Reporters Without Borders have all come out. The NUJ has come out in defense of Assange. That's the journalist union. That's the journalist union, I beg your pardon. And so it, I think the balance is changing and I think people are beginning to see through Simon, you're a peace man, an anti-war man, peace pledge union, white poppies, as opposed to the red ones. Uh, don't you feel that the military industrial complex about which President Eisenhower warned as he left office in the 1950s yeah. has become like a monster uh, within the state and that this is a monster that has to be put back in its box. Absolutely, and we underestimate in the UK, I think, how much influence military leaders have, so, and the, how much influence the arms industry has. So, um, you know, we see, uh, for example, in the Chilcot report, which was the um, official report, report into the Iraq, the Iraq war, yeah. One of the bits that journalists tended to overlook was where it, revealed that British military leaders had lobbied Tony Blair to actually send more troops to Iraq than he was originally minded to do. And I really, I really want to pick up on what Rod said about Julian Assange challenging the ability to wage war at all. And I'd like to mention another political prisoner whose name isn't so well known, even in the UK, which is Michael Lyons. And Michael Lyons was a, a sailor, a member of the British Navy, 24 years old, and was told that he was going to go and fight in Afghanistan. This was in 2010. And around the same time that many of the WikiLeaks revelations came out, and after reading the WikiLeaks revelations about war crimes in Afghanistan, he said to his wife Lillian, I can't have that on my conscience. And he refused to go to Afghanistan. And in theory, members of the British Armed Forces, if they have a change of heart, can apply for discharge as a conscientious objector. But it's almost never allowed and almost never done. Most soldiers don't even know they can do it. He went through that process. He went through the whole process by the book um, and they turned him down. And then when they turned him down, they ordered him to pick up a rifle. He refused and 
he was charged with disobeying an order. Um, and they turned him down, of course, because if he'd been allowed to leave, so would others. They were worried about opening the floodgates. Um, and I sat in the public gallery at part of his court-martial and I saw this complete um, sham of a trial in which a 24-year-old man with a conscience who now regretted having joined the armed forces was sent to military prison for seven months because he'd refused to pick up a rifle after he'd gone through all the official due process of applying to leave the Navy and they wouldn't let him because what will really stop people obeying war, what really stopped people fighting war is when troops refuse to fight because of course the militarists, the governments of the world only have power as long as people do what they're told. Well, I really could talk about this all night with these distinguished guests, but alas, our time is up. I hope that you have found it valuable. I've been George Galloway. This is Kali Mahora on Al Mayadeen Television.